An alternative telling of Matthew 4, 1 to 11, written specifically for paradox in 2023. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by evil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, Woe to you, tempter, for he has spoken the truth. It is written, God upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. Then Jesus snapped his fingers, and all of the rocks within a mile instantly turned to bread. Led by the scent of fresh-baked bread, all of the poor and the hungry streamed out from the city of Jerusalem and arrived in the wilderness. Once there, Jesus broke the bread. My friends, eat as much as you want, for in the kingdom of God, everyone has enough to eat, and no one goes hungry. Thus, Jesus, in his weakness, fell to the first temptation of the tempter. Shortly thereafter, the tempter took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. But Jesus answered, Woe to you, tempter, for you have again spoken truthfully. For it is written, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own insight. In your ways acknowledge God, and God will make your path straight. And so Jesus jumped from the highest point of the temple. Immediately, four angels in a fiery blaze of supersonic glory descended from heaven and caught Jesus. The entire city of Jerusalem witnessed this divine intervention, and all of them grew stronger in their faith because they had witnessed the work of God firsthand. Thus Jesus, in his weakness, fell to the second temptation of the tempter. Again, the tempter took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. But Jesus answered, Woe to you, tempter, for you have made me an offer I cannot refuse. For it is written, So the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And then Jesus, the Son of God, bowed his head down low and worshipped the tempter. All of the suffering in the world instantly vanished. Sorrow disappeared. Sickness evaporated. The planet cooled. Poverty ceased to exist. And every human being lived in an unprecedented era of love, peace, and joy that continues to this day. Thus Jesus, in his weakness, fell to the third temptation of the tempter. May this alternative telling help you to grow in appreciation for the original story in Matthew 4. A few years ago... Over a decade ago, in fact, I was a third-year architecture student at Montana State University, home of the Fighting Bobcats. And in third-year architecture school, we took a trip to Portland in order to learn urban design because there's not a whole lot of urban design happening in Bozeman, Montana. And so we went to Portland, and the way architecture school works is they take you to a very real site and then give you a hypothetical project. And so they led us to this street corner that was an empty parking lot, and they said, we want you, for your project, to imagine and design a building right here. This will be an apartment complex of affordable housing that is specifically for rehabilitation programs to get people who are homeless in Portland off the street and back into society. And so we talked all week long in Portland about this project. And it was sometime around Thursday that a classmate of mine named Kyle, not his real name, started to get a little irritated by the professors, and it became visibly irritated. And as they were going on and on about the importance of building affordable housing, 
Kyle all of a sudden said, I mean, what is the point of designing affordable housing? I mean, no matter how hard we try, there will always be homeless people in Portland. Now, I remember judging him in that moment, thinking to myself, wow, I am so much more superior than this guy. I have better morals because I would never say something like that. Which is why it was surprising to me to read the Gospel of Matthew and discover that Jesus might have said amen to this second part of Kyle's statement. Because Jesus says something very similar to this statement in the very last, or second to last chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew 26, we are reading a story about Jesus who is at a table. There are a bunch of men around. They are talking. Jesus is almost about to be crucified. And as he is sitting there, a woman barges in, breaks open an expensive bottle of ointment, and dumps it on Jesus. Now, instantly, she is judged in the same way that I judge others, and I'm working on it. But they were sitting there, and they were thinking to themselves, really, that money could have been used to help the poor. Jesus picks up on this, and he turns to them and says something rather surprising to them. He says, hey, you'll always have the poor people with you. Now, this is a bizarre statement from the one guy that Christians believe could have fixed this problem, right? Right? This is a bizarre statement to hear, particularly when we look at the passage that we're studying this morning. Because 22 chapters earlier, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we come across this story of temptations. And these temptations are where the devil says, hey, I'm going to invite you, I want to tempt you to turn rocks into bread. Jesus says, no thanks. The very next temptation is the tempter, the devil leads Jesus up to the top of the temple and says, why don't you jump off? and show everybody that God is real. And Jesus is like, no thanks. Then the devil leads Jesus up to the top of mountain and says, hey, if you bow before me, I'll give you the world back. Jesus says, no thanks. And it's only as I've grown that I started to ask myself the question, what if Jesus fell to those temptations? Well, the hungry are fed, the doubters believe, and suffering was relieved. If Jesus fell to these temptations, the world would be a better place, right? Which raises the question, why doesn't Jesus fall to these temptations for the greater good? It's almost like, Jesus, you had the devil saying, we can skip the whole crucifixion thing. We can just go straight to it. This is a trade. I'll give you the world. You give me your soul, and we'll do it. And Jesus says, no. I'm going to go through the whole charade of the rest of the gospel, right? This should surprise all of us as to why Jesus doesn't fall to these temptations when all of the outcomes are very good. So that raises the question, what is it that happens after Jesus turns down these temptations? Well, we're going to go through the Gospel of Matthew in a lightning fast succession because we're going to give you a survey of what all happens in the next 22 chapters until we return to that banquet that started our conversation. Later on that chapter, Jesus goes to the synagogue in Capernaum, and we read these words, and people suffering from illnesses and painful ailments of all kinds, those who were demon-possessed, those who were epileptic, those who were paralyzed, were brought to Jesus, and he healed them. Then Jesus spends the next three chapters on the side of a mountain as a poor person speaking to other poor people about how they can find meaning, beauty, purpose, and love in the life they are living right now. They don't have to wait for liberation from the Romans before they can start enjoying their life. Then in Matthew 8, Jesus heals an outcast that is a leper. He heals a Roman centurion's servant, which was not popular with the Jewish people. And then he heals Peter's mother-in-law. And then he heals two people who are possessed by demons, and he then welcomes them back into society. In the next chapter, Jesus heals a paralytic who has been condemned by the religious institution as being a sinful person and deserving of his paralysis. And Jesus says, who cares about sin? Let's watch somebody walk. And he gets up and walks. The next chapter, Jesus equips his disciples to go out and heal those who are hurting. And then in the next chapter, Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, is in jail, and he's coming to the end of his life, and he knows it. And so he's filled with an intense amount of doubt. 
And this doubt is overwhelming him. So he sends messengers asking Jesus for hope. And he says, are you actually the Messiah? I need to know right now. And Jesus sends a messenger back to this doubting John the Baptist that says, those who are blind recover their sight. Those who cannot walk are able to walk. Those with leprosy are cured. Those who are deaf hear. The dead are raised to life. And the anawim, the have-nots, have the good news preached to them. And John lets go of his doubt. Then in the next chapter, Jesus is sitting surrounded by 5,000 families. He looks out and he's like, these people are hungry. Let's feed them all. And the text says, all those present ate their fill. In the next chapter, he goes up another hillside next to the Sea of Galilee. And we read these words, large crowds gathered, bringing with them people who had physical deformities or couldn't walk or were blind or deaf and many others. Those they put down at Jesus' feet and Jesus healed them. After healing them, Jesus looks around and says, oh, there's 4,000 families here. Why don't we feed all of them again? And the hungry are fed. And then Jesus, in the next chapter, sees children all around him, and people try to push the children aside. He's like, hey, you're all having trouble with doubt. You should learn how to believe like a child again and just be so absorbed in the present that you're sad when you have to go to bed. Jesus then crosses the Jordan in the next chapter, and we read that large crowds followed him, and Jesus healed them there. On the other side of the Jordan, guess who greets Jesus? Children. He affirms their childlike wonder once again and says, this is what we should be striving toward as adults. Then he goes to the city of Jericho. He encounters two blind people. And Jesus, rather than just healing them, he has great pity on them. He touches their eyes, and immediately they are allowed to see again. Then Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, and there are people around him who have been beleaguered and put cast down by society. And they look, and they are filled with great hope, joy, and optimism. And they say, Hosanna to the Messiah. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Most High. Hosanna in the highest. And as Jesus rides into Jerusalem, he goes straight to the temple in Matthew's gospel. He grabs a whip. He looks at all of the... the um, financial exploitation that is happening and how it's masked in the vehicle of religion, and he loses it. He clears the temple, and he quotes scripture saying, my house is called to be a house of prayer, but you make it a den of thieves. Then over the next three chapters, Jesus teaches in the shadow of the temple about what it means to believe. He says one of my favorite passages when somebody says to him, what's the most important commandment? He said, really, there's two, love God, love others. That's basically what all of the Bible is telling you till this point. And then after that, he goes to Bethany and has this meal, and all of these people are around him. They see this woman dumping this expensive ointment on him, and he hears their thoughts, he hears what they're saying, and he says, oh, you'll always have the poor people with you. And out of context, it sounds like Jesus is calloused and indifferent to poor folks. But what has Jesus been doing for the last 22 chapters in Matthew? Taking care of the poor. His whole life is taking care of the poor, people who can't afford health care. He goes straight to them, provides health care. People who are hungry, he goes there, gives them food to eat. What does Jesus do in the 22 chapters after he's tempted by the devil? Well, he feeds the hungry. He brings belief to the doubters, and he relieves suffering. My friends, this is exactly what the devil tempted Jesus to do in the wilderness. This is it. And Jesus said, no, I'm not going to do those things here, and then spent the rest of his life doing that. This should cause you to pause when it comes to this story and say, something's not adding up right here. Because I was told that the value of this story was that it taught me that I needed to memorize Scripture in case the devil showed up and tempted me. I could say, get away, devil. I've learned Isaiah 51. And I know it, Right? And the whole idea behind this story that so many Christians teach is that the devil was tempting Jesus to be an imperfect human. And Jesus needed to be perfect in order to be a perfect sacrifice on the cross, and that's the way it works. But if you look closely at the temptations, you realize, I don't think he's tempted to be a human. He's being tempted to be something else because I've never been tempted to turn rocks into bread. I've never been asked by the devil to bow before him so that the whole world can stop suffering. I may have been tempted to jump off a building to see if angels will catch me, but that's in the minority of my life experience, right? 
My friends, what is so moving to me about this story is that in this story, the devil is not tempting Jesus to be human. Rather, the devil is tempting Jesus to be God. Think about this for a moment. Imagine that you had the power inside you to snap your fingers and all the rocks around you would turn to bread and you could feed as many people as you saw. Would you do it? Of course you would. You're good people. You're not selfish. You would give away this bread for free because it comes so naturally to you. And why don't you do that? Because you're not God. You can't turn rocks into bread. God, we believe, can, but that's not a temptation that we face. Imagine if you could jump off a building and command angels to catch you so everyone around you could believe. Would you do that? Of course you would. You would do this because you would bring hope to people who are doubting that life is good, that there is some greater plan in this existence. If you could command angels, you would do this in a heartbeat. But you can't because you're not God. You're a human. Imagine that the devil spoke to you, just yes, you, and said, I'll, give you a I'll make you a deal. If you take the fall for every human being on the planet, almost 8 billion people now, if you take the fall and you die right now, all the other people in the world will not suffer ever again. Would you take that? I think you would. You guys are nice people. All of the suffering in the world you could just eliminate like that? You'd be happy to do that because you are loving and kind people. And so when we look at these temptations, they are not temptations to become human, they are temptations to become God, because let's face it, world hunger is a real problem that human beings face. And it would be nice if there was a quick shortcut that could happen at the snap of a finger, right? And when Jesus is being tempted by the devil, the devil is almost asking him, hey, are you sure you actually want to be human? Because you have to live with this problem. And there's no easy shortcut out. And Jesus says, I will live as a human being. I will live with the problem, the unresolved problem of world hunger. The second temptation. There's this massive amount of doubt. There are people who are wondering if God still loves them. And Jesus can fix all of that by jumping off a temple and showing them angels. And the devil says, why don't you do that? Why don't you bring hope to these weary people? And Jesus says, if I did that, I wouldn't be human. I wouldn't actually be human. That's something else. And the devil says, I dare you to live in a world filled with doubt, despair, depression, and uncertainty. And Jesus says, okay. When it comes to the suffering of the world, I mean, this is the number one reason why it's hard to believe that God is good and powerful and in control of things. There is this opportunity for God, for Jesus, to erase all of that. And he says, no. If I erase all of that, then I'm not actually a human being. To live in the face of unresolved suffering is actually what it means to be human. This season that we are in is the season of Lent, and it is a very old season. It's over 1,700 years old. It started because early Christians were told that Jesus was coming back in their lifetime and Jesus did not. And they were, started saying to themselves, uh, Jesus was supposed to be back by now. We should, um, we should start making plans for the long haul because I'm not sure Jesus is coming back in my lifetime. And so the word Lent means the lengthening of days, and it's during the spring because the days are getting longer, and it felt like longer and longer to the early Christians that Jesus said he would be back and when Jesus was actually coming back. So the central question of this season, which is Lent, is this. How do you live in this imperfect world before the return of the perfect Christ? How is it that you live with unresolved world hunger? How is it that you live with doubt? How is it that you live with suffering? And Christians believe that God gave us a very clear answer to this question. The answer is the life of Jesus. The way Jesus lived and moved and breathed through this world was in a way where he couldn't fix all of the world's problems. And when we talk about what it means to be human, being human does not mean solving all of the world's problems. Rather, being human means becoming aware of the world's suffering and then responding to that suffering with love. 
And when we look at what Jesus did, he wasn't able to fix all of the world's problems in just an instant. Instead, he helped the person right in front of him. Now, you could say, well, he did miracles and all of these things. I would say that's great, and I really appreciate that word, but let's just pause for a minute and realize what's happening here. There's lots of healthcare folks in this room. You are able to do the same thing as Jesus did 2,000 years ago now, thanks to modern medicine. And while it can be overwhelming to look at world suffering and think, will it ever change? There is this life of Jesus that continues to push forward and continues to help those who are in need, particularly those who have been downtrodden by society. What I love about the life of Jesus is that Jesus teaches us that the world's problems do not need to be solved for me to live a beautiful life. That does not mean I'm indifferent to the world's suffering. Quite the opposite, in fact. I'm fully engaged with the world's suffering because I'm following Jesus, and that's exactly how he responded to suffering. The world's problems do not need to be solved for me to live a beautiful life. This reminds me of a beautiful life that is living not too far from here. This life is a woman named Kim who was born and raised in San Bernardino. When she was five, she had her first drink of alcohol. When she was seven, she had her first hit of cocaine. She had a daughter shortly thereafter, and shortly thereafter that had to give that daughter away. She went on to the streets very quickly because of her drug addiction, and once she was on the streets, she started committing crimes, and she wound up in prison. Now, the way that Kim describes prison is she would say, sometimes when I went to jail, it was a blessing. Why? Because in jail, I was able to lay down and I was able to sleep, unlike the streets of from where I had come. And then I would be let out again, back out into homelessness. Now, if you think this is a success story of the prison complex, I will tell you, no, it's not. Because she says that she went in and out of homeless or in and out of prison over and over again because there was this failure from the prison complex to address her needs and actually be interested in her restoration. She said, prison did not treat my addictions. It did not get to the root causes of my homelessness. And so I cycled in and out, in and out, in and out, until finally I got one opportunity, thanks to someone's generosity, to be en enrolled in an, uh, a rehab program. And I took it, they put me in a house, I got a job, and they worked with me day and night until I got to see my daughter again. Now, Kim, a few years after this, in 2002, started a foundation called the Time for Change Foundation. This is a remarkable organization that meets women where they are, women who are suffering from homelessness or from prison. And so they meet them at the bus stop, they meet women at the hospital when they just get out, they, meet, they go and pick up women when they are released from prison, they bring them into their program and they teach them how to be self-sufficient and every day they are trying to reunite these women with their children. She says this about this, she's like, I can't make up for the time I lost with my daughter, but I can make sure another mother doesn't lose time with theirs. This work is so inspiring that in 2015, she was recognized as a CNN hero, and then she received the highest honor one could possibly get in the land. She spoke at Paradox Church in 2017. <laughs> now, in 2022, just last year, she went on the Jennifer Hudson show, and she said, she talked about affordable housing and how much that's been her work for the last five years and trying to make it so there's more affordable housing here in the Inland Empire. She said to Jennifer Hudson, I went from homelessness to building affordable homes. And Jennifer Hudson surprised her by having a woman who had gone through her program, and it is obvious that Kim loves this woman. And when you look at this lifetime of work, which it just crossed 20 years as the Time for Change Foundation in the work of San Bernardino, it is remarkable. But we have to be honest about something. Things have gotten worse. Just this last week, or I'm sorry, two weeks ago, San Bernardino declared a local emergency for homelessness because San Bernardino homelessness has increased by 175% in the last five years. And despite all the work that we're doing, the problems are getting worse. Now, a cynic may ask, is Kim Carter, is she failing? Because, like, isn't this what she's supposed to work, that, work against, right? 
To which we would all say, of course not. She's part of the solution, not part of the problem. And we're going to talk just a little bit about the systemic issues that surround this. The number one thing is I've talked to people who are in homeless, uh, the homelessness and working on how to put together solutions. They say whatever you can do, whenever you hear about affordable housing, support it any way you can. And you can also support organizations like Time for Change Foundation, which makes much quicker short-term fixes. And we as a church have adopted Time for Change Foundation. We've had it adopted for five years. In that time, we've donated over $8,000 to this organization. And I'm very proud to be affiliated with Time for Change Foundation. And when I look at all of this, and yes, the numbers are grim and homelessness is getting worse, there is this sense that maybe it's not worth doing all of it. Maybe it's a waste of time. We go back to my architecture classmate saying, hey, there's always going to be homeless people here. Why even try? And I believe that Jesus would hear that and say, because when you try, you find a life that is beautiful and a life that is worth living. Amen. My friends, Kim Carter is living like Jesus. She is following in the footsteps of Jesus by saying, I will help the people in front of me. I will work on systemic problems, but I will always help the people in front of me. Imagine if she came here and said to us, hey, we're going to try to solve homelessness, but if we don't succeed, we'll, we'll stop trying. It's not worth it. That's not what she said. She said, we will fully engage in this, and we will continue to love the people around us. And what she lives by is the same thing that Jesus lived by so long ago. The world's problems have not been solved, and yet she continues to live beautifully. This life of Jesus continues to inspire me 2,000 years later because Jesus went into the world as a human being with arms wide open and gave it the biggest hug imaginable. It is the engagement of human life not the disengagement and pushing away of human life. My friends, may this story inspire you in the same way it inspires me and inspires people like Kim Carter. May you embrace your humanity in the same way that Jesus once did. May you willingly accept that hunger, doubt, and suffering are part of what it means to be human. May you give yourself grace when you feel discouraged by suffering, and may you have a compassionate heart for those in need. May you let go of the burden to solve all of the world's problems, and may you be inspired to help the person who is right next to you. And may you follow in the footsteps of Jesus and live beautifully in this imperfect world. Amen. <laughs>